If you're like me, you think of the PSP as a fairly modern handheld console. Well, I've got some bad news for you. Better find yourself a seat. It's 17 years old. It does its A-levels next year. In fact, it's old enough to learn to drive. Next year, it can go to uni, vote, and drink. So, yep, that's it. The PSP is retro. I'm calling it. So, given it's now officially retro, in this video we're going to first have a little look at the history of the PSP and its hardware, we'll then look at all the revisions of the PSP that there are, and there's been quite a few, and finally, we'll talk about collecting for the PSP for those who have not done it, or are just thinking about it, or are already doing it. In 2003, when Sony announced the PSP at E3, a year prior to it going on sale, Sony was riding pretty high in the console market. The first PlayStation had marched in, took the lead in that market. From absolutely out of nowhere, the PlayStation 2 was an even bigger success and is still the largest selling console of all time. Nintendo had been pushed into second place, with Microsoft's Xbox snapping at its heels, and Sega, well, they were out of the market altogether. However, in the handheld space, Nintendo ruled the roost. Its original Game Boy was a smash hit, and the Game Boy advanced the followed, well that was doing incredibly well too. A fair few companies had tried to grab a share of the market. For example, Sega's Game Gear, which was released about the same time as the original Game Boy, well that racked up 10 million sales, which is a lot. But not compared to the Game Boy that sold 118 million units. Others got nowhere near that close, like Giant of the Mobile Phone World Nokia and its Engage, or Bandai's Wonderswan, or heck, even Atari's Lynx. So Sony were daring to tread where basically everyone apart from Nintendo had failed before. In the end, the PSP racked up somewhere between 8 to 82 million units, meaning it's currently outsold the Switch, and it's possibly outsold the Game Boy Advance, and definitely the 3DS. The PSP still did get outsold by the original Game Boy, but heck, that thing's like the second best-selling console of all time. It also got outsold by the DS family as well. This means it's still the best-selling handhold that's made by someone who isn't Nintendo. And even with all Nintendo stuff, it's still the third or fourth best-selling console there was in the handheld market. So there's no two ways about it. The PSP was definitely a success. The first time I encountered the PSP was in the back of a car on my way to a gig in Derby. I've never seen anything quite like it in a handheld before. Before the PSP, a handheld's graphics did not look that great. The Game Boy Advance, which was probably about as good as it got at the time, well, it did well with 2D games, but, yeah, no, 3D not really a thing for it. I mean, basically it was a few generations behind the regular consoles. PSP, on the other hand, well, it ran 3D textured graphics, which were not that far off from the look of what the PS2 was able to manage. You could say I was definitely impressed the first time I saw one, and really wanted to know more about it, so when I got back home from my gig, I decided to look up the PSP. This is when I found out for the first time, it had a MIPS R4000 in there, the same CPU SGI used in its workstations and servers in the early 90s. Yep, the CPU from a $30,000 workstation has now made its way into a handheld, it had a pretty decent clock rate too. Sony already had some experience with the MIPS CPU, as they used one in the PS2. Now in the PSP CPU, not only had Sony packed in the R4000 we mentioned before, but it also got in a floating point unit and a vector floating point unit for single instruction multiple data. PSP's GPU, known as the Media Engine, was also based on the MIPS CPU too, with hardware video decoding and a programmable DSP, known as the Virtual Mobile Engine. This was an incredible amount of computing power to put into a handheld, especially as at this time, smartphones were still quite a way off. Here's a picture of its PCB for you to have a quick look at. As you can see, it sort of looks like one of the US states, probably one of the southern ones, I think. With the PSP, Sony introduced a new disc format, the Universal Media Disc, or UMD for short. And the UMD was not just for games. Sony wanted to sell the PSP as not just a handheld console, but also a portable movie player, an MP3 player, an all-round multimedia device. With UMD Movie, Sony wanted to replicate its success with the PS2, which is also a DVD player. This had really helped Sony's sales of the PS2, because lots of people at the time wanted a DVD player. And, well, the PS2 was one, so you could have a DVD player that didn't play PlayStation games, or you could have a DVD player that did. Well, a lot of people wanted the one that did. Sony saw the PSP and the UMD as the portable equivalent of the DVD, ideal for the Japanese commuter market. The PSP came out in that odd window of time where we had good portable electronics, but we still didn't have smartphones yet. So Sony not only saw Nintendo and its handhelds as competition, but also the iPod, and especially the video iPod. So Sony really pushed the PSP as a UMD player, and as the MP3 player, and a decent way to look at photos as well. 
as the video format it did surprisingly well, being supported by most major film studios and getting a number of TV box sets as well. Ok, I mean it didn't do as well as VHS or DVD, but it was far more successful than all the previous disc formats before it like VCD and CD and HVD. It even did better than some formats that would follow like HD DVD. The UMD could hold about 1.8 gig of data, and for films was annoyingly region coded like DVDs, but fortunately not for games. UMD movies were encoded at the same resolution as DVD, but downscaled by the PSP screen. If you're wondering how they could fit a whole film in at the same resolution as a DVD and yet have much less storage space, well that comes down to the compression technique. DVD used MPEG-2, the same as broadcast TV, whereas the UMD used MPEG-4, which is basically the same compression technique we use now for most mobile and streamed video. However, the reduced space did mean that most UMDs didn't come with extras or anything that a DVD would come with, although some still did, but that tended to be on films that were, well, a little bit shorter. In terms of experience, it's fairly similar to DVD. When you pop the disc in, you get a little splash screen, you can then start the disc. Then you get a little menu with a few options. One of which is always, play movie. If you happen to stop playing the movie or just turn the PSP off, when you next turn the machine back on and hit play, you'll be given the option to resume, which is much nicer than having to go back to the beginning and fast forward through to where you want to. The UMD gave Sony some confidence over piracy in the PSP as there was no consumer writable UMDs. If you wanted to make a UMD, you were going to have to press it in a factory. In fact, this difficult to pirate idea was something that Sony used to go sell game studios on developing stuff for the PSP in the first place. This confidence, however, was fairly short-lived. As it turns out, yeah, you could copy stuff. Yeah, it was not long before the PSP's firmware got cracked. And with most games not using the whole 1.8 gig, ripping an ISO of it, sticking it on your memory stick and playing it from there turned out to be way more feasible than Sony were hoping for. And the first way the PSP's firmware got cracked was, well, by mistakes in game code. Turns out a couple of games had flaws where if you loaded a slightly corrupted save game, you could crash the game. Well, hackers soon found out how to exploit that to essentially crack open the entire operating system. So Sony kept producing new firmwares to close each and every window, but every time they did, someone found a new one. And this arms race continued for a long time until Sony essentially gave up because they were no longer developing for the console. And this is why today you'll still find a load of copies of some games you're thinking, wow, how did that sell really well? Well, it sold well because it was one of the ones that had a bug in its save game code, so people bought them essentially so they could break into their PSP and run homebrew code and copy games. PSP came with a number of hardware features that really aided it as a games console and as a multimedia player that competing devices, well, just simply didn't have. They may seem like obvious things to include now, but they sure as heck weren't then. Firstly, the PSP comes with Wi-Fi. Admittedly, early 2000s Wi-Fi, you know, it's 802.11b and runs a whole 11 megabits with WPA instead of WPA2. So, you know, you might not want it on your home network these days, but back then, Wi-Fi and a handheld device, that was a thing. This Wi-Fi connection really opened up a whole bunch of options. First, multiplayer over Wi-Fi which you could do by either joining a pre-existing Wi-Fi network using an access point, or you could create an ad hoc network wherever you were. Multiplayer worked really well on the PSP. In a way, it just never had before on a handheld. I mean, firstly, no cables made a real difference. Yeah, Atari Lynx were looking at you there. It being included by default on the PSP also meant that virtually every game supported multiplayer. And with some games even supporting game sharing, you only needed one copy of the game in some cases. Admittedly, lots of games also needed everyone to have their own copy if you're going to have multiplayer, but still, multiplayer fun was had. The Wi-Fi connection also opened up a whole bunch of other options. Firstly, the PSP had a web browser, and it was not a bad one of that too, and again, this is before smartphones or tablets were a thing, so having a web browser you could use around the house without looking at an entire laptop was quite a thing back then. They also had a podcast client built in, and an internet streaming radio client. Sony then added some software called Feed Player, which with the right base station let you watch broadcast TV on the go. The final addition was to add a Skype client so you could make Skype calls from it. Once the PS3 was released, they even added a remote control feature which lets you drive the PS3 from your PSP. And some PS3 games could even make use of the PSP as a second screen. Usually it was just something like, say, a map or a radar scanner. Nothing that was absolutely vital to the gameplay, because after all, some users might not have a PSP. 
Sony unsurprisingly also introduced an online store for the PSP, which is just closing down now, which let you buy and download PSP games and PS1 games. Yep, the PSP had sufficient processing power to emulate the original PlayStation. All in all, Sony got a lot out of adding Wi-Fi to the PSP. Other hardware features it had was removable flash storage. I mean, Sony went with its memory stick format there, which is using everything Sony made at the time from digital cameras, their Handycam video cameras, admittedly the video was stored on tape and just stills were on the memory stick, but still, they used it. They also added it to their DVD players and some TVs, even their Vio range of laptops. Oddly, both the PS2 and PS3, yeah, no memory stick support whatsoever. Price-wise, memory stick was kind of comparable with the other formats that would eventually overtake it. But for an MP3 player, changeable memory sticks were, well, a bit of a bonus. These days you can just use a memory stick to SD adapter, which means you can make use of some pretty massive SD cards, which gives you more storage than most hard disk based MP3 players at the time had. Another nice feature is that you could easily change the battery. Yep, it had a custom battery, but you could have a spare that you could change it with whenever you wanted to. So you could take that spare out fully charged and have a lot more playtime on the go if that's what you wanted. At this point in time, a changeable battery was a pretty handy thing, because we'd entered the era of electronics manufacturers just gluing a lithium-ion battery into their products, which you'd have to dismantle the entire device if you wanted to change it. Right, let's have a look at the first PSP I ever bought. This is the first model Sony released, the 1000. Now as you can see, I've still got the box for it, and it came with a few handy little extras, like a little stand, so you could sit it up and watch videos on it. A remote control, so you could change the track and volume and stuff when you were using it as an MP3 player without having to take it out of your pocket. We've got some little headphones, which clearly I've never used. A screen cleaning cloth, ooh. And of course, this nice padded sleeve to help keep it safe. The 1000 is the first model Sony released, and also still my favorite. It has a really nice disc mechanism for the UMD discs, which I really liked, and sadly they dumped in later models for something far cheaper and much less pleasant feeling. The 1000 also had an IRDA port, a kind of infrared serial communications thing. It was quite common on laptops and phones at the time, and PDAs. It was basically more or less a serial port without the cable. Some devices could also use it to be an infrared remote control, and after including it, Sony made no use of it whatsoever. I mean, there isn't a single bit of software that can make use of this thing. It's unsurprising it was ditched on later models. You also have a slot for the memory stick, a headphone jack, this little connector right next to it that the remote uses. There's also a power connector for recharging it and powering it externally. We also have a mini USB connector, again, for charging, but also connecting it for your PC, so you can copy media files off and on, like photos and MP3 files and MPEG4 videos, and also later on homebrew software. Now let's move on to the next model, the 2000, or as some people referred to it at the time, the Slim. I mean, it is a whole 19% slimmer. The 2000 got some nice hardware upgrades to the screen. It's a bit brighter, the board around each pixel is a bit smaller. The onboard RAM also got doubled from 32 meg to 64 meg. Most of that upgrade got used for caching, which really did help speed up game load times from the UMD. But as game software for the PSP had to run on the 1000, it's not like most PSP owners knew which one they bought, Sony just sold the PSP, so games devs couldn't depend on their having 64 meg in there. As mentioned before, the IRDA port was gone, as sadly was the nice UMD load mechanism to be replaced with, well, just a flap. I mean, this feels so cheap compared to the old one. On the plus side though, they did introduce the option to plug it into an external TV, by slightly reworking the old remote connector. This can be done with either composite video, if you bought the composite video cable, or component digital video. You know, it's quite posh for them. The battery also got a bit slimmer too, so it no longer had a bulge at the back. It does hold less charge, however the 2000 was made a little bit more power efficient, so it had more or less the same runtime. The 2000 also weighs a fair bit less. This meant, or at least this is how I feel about it, it was not as nice a feel in the hand. It had no heft to it. It felt, well, a bit too light and maybe that bit too cheap. There were also complaints about the screen, with some users posting about ghosting and blur. So, Sony had a third go, the 3000. This one had an even better screen, it had five times the contrast, and twice the pixel response time to help get rid of that ghosting. This is where they also had a mic for online chat, which Skype would get to use later on as well. The button's got a bit of a restyling as well, with the home button now being a PSP logo, which brought the whole thing on a bit more brand with the rest of the PlayStations. 
This version of the PSP is the one Sony kept in production for the longest time. In fact, it'd keep going right almost until the end of production, even after they introduced the PSP Go. While all these hardware changes were going on, Sony also started to make the PSP available in a white plastic case rather than just the black. The marketing for this had some problems, especially in the Netherlands with this poster. Yep, Sony signed that one off and then apologised for it. This poster also came back to haunt Sony in later years, when this tweet went viral. Literally just make the most racist thing you can imagine. Wait, what? We'll give you ten grand. Ta-da! Yeah. Of course, Nintendo thought it would attempt to capitalise on Sony's marketing misfortune and release this ad. This is of course not Sony's only oopsie when it came to marketing the PSP, oh no. When they launched the PSP, they came up with a marvellous marketing plan, which we can only assume was codename Let's Do Crime. Yes, they hired a number of graffiti artists to go and spray graffiti in various cities in the US to market the PSP. Unsurprisingly, when people saw that Sony were paying people to do crimes, yeah, that, that marketing plan did not go down well. Sony got into a bit of trouble and then had to admit that actually they paid building owners for the space, and yeah, the whole thing was a little bit embarrassing and not the sleek urban presentation that Sony were perhaps shooting for. The PSP Go is the first change to the PSP where Sony pointed out to customers that it was something a bit different by adding the word Go into the name. Sony really needed to do this, and well, you'll see why. Here, if I flip this thing over, you'll notice something very significant. No UMD drive. This meant there was no official way to play any games or UMD movies that were on shop shelves or that you might have bought already. All games, films, etc. for it needed to be bought at Sony's online PSP store and saved into the internal flash or a memory stick. Be fair to say the PSP Go did not go down well with customers or reviewers or any form of hominid really. As most people viewed it as a bit worse than the original PSP and it was more expensive too. Most of the reviewers that really criticised the PSP Go by and large kept pointing to the fact that there was no UMD drive. Other fairly reasonable criticisms was the position of the analog stick was, you know, a bit more awkward than it had been before. And you know, they got a fairly reasonable point. I mean, it's not as bad as some of them made out, but you know, it's definitely more awkward. Now I must admit, no UMD drive is really what put me off the PSP Go for years, but as you can see, I've got one now. We'll come on to what won me over in a later part of this video. Now as you can see, the PSP Go is diddy when compared to all the others. The slide out design kept controls off the sides of the screen, which means the reduction in size has hardly touched the screen size. Sony also finally added Bluetooth so you could connect to modern phones for internet access, which admittedly cost an absolute bomb back then. You could also use a DualShock 3 controller with it. And of course, Bluetooth headphones and speakers. They also ditched the mini USB connector for this proprietary connector, which is a bit of a pain, but it was a lot more robust than the mini USB and you could connect other things to it like the AV cable. Sony even made a dock which you could leave plugged into the TV that you could sit your PSP Go into and it would charge it and let you play it on the TV at the same time with a wireless controller. You know, just like you can with the Switch, only, you know, a decade earlier. One connector Sony did keep, however, was the headphone jack, as they knew removing it would pointlessly annoy people. Could someone send a copy of this video to Apple? Sadly for Sony, the PSP Go was, well, a market failure. I mean, it made the Atari Lynx look successful. So Sony soon killed it, and kept the 3000 on sale until the very end of the production run of the PSP. There is one last PSP revision Sony put out, but only in Europe, the E1000 Street. Now I've not got one of these to show you, and I'll explain why. In the meantime, just enjoy this picture of it. The E1000 Street was a cut price PSP. The UMD drive was even cheaper. Ugh. It had no Wi-Fi at all, but they had made it a bit thicker again, so it was sort of the thickness of the 1000. So it felt nicer in the hand, but yeah, it was just a cheap cut price PSP. These days, maybe you wouldn't miss the Wi-Fi quite so much, because it's not like you're going to want to connect it to your home network on a regular basis, but you really would miss out on the whole multiplayer thing. The PSP line came to an end with the release of the PS Vita, which is basically a complete replacement of all the hardware, although it could run PSP games via emulation. In Europe, it was not a great success, and basically when the PSP 4 got released, in Europe and America, yeah, they were trying to just pretend that the PS Vita just wasn't a thing. In Japan, however, it really did have a good second life, and went on to sell a pretty decent number of units there, just, just nowhere else. Now you can tell from this shot of most of my PSP stuff, I'm a little bit into the PSP. 
I'm also the person who bought a fair few UMD movies too. So let's talk about why you might want to get into the PSP yourself. Well, first and foremost, it's got to be the games. PSP really does have a cracking games library for it. I'll tell you the number of hours I've spent playing Wipeout. I think the PSP version probably is my favourite. It also has a version of pretty much every major franchise there is too. Let's have a look at one or two. Okay, I'm going to have to apologise for my playing a bit here. As I'm a little rusty, I mean, I've not had that much time for gaming of late. Also, when you plug the component cable into this thing so I can video capture it for you, it turns off the built-in screen, so the version I've got, well, it's from the capture card, so it's got a little bit of a lag. And by a little bit, I actually mean, yeah, okay, quite a lot. If I plug this thing directly into the TV, there'd be no lag at all. The lag comes entirely from the capture device, but still, that doesn't mean that I'm not seeing a really lag display. It's really weird. It's like playing a game through treacle. So, you've seen Wipeout, a bit of Call of Duty, Need for Speed, even a version of GTA, Liberty City Stories. I mean, I can keep showing you games forever and a day. There's just a massive catalogue of titles for this thing. Now, I mentioned Homebrew earlier. Well, this is another area in which the PSP shines. The homebrew scene has yielded some really great emulators for the PSP. There was also some commercial ones as well. Sega put out an emulator with a number of titles on UMD as well. You've also got Pico Drive, which is a homebrew emulator. It does a really good job of emulating the Mega Drive. There's a version of SNES 9X that managed to achieve a really great frame rate. And of course, as you'd expect, yeah, it's, it's got a Game Boy emulator and a Game Boy Advanced emulator. Heck, there's even a Vectrex emulator. There is also an N64 emulator, but frankly that thing just sucks. Yep, more or less anything you could reasonably expect the PSP to emulate, it does. So it's a really great handheld retro gaming system. It's also still a fairly good media player. Now, I know you've probably got a phone that does all of that, but a PSP is small and portable and you don't tank your phone battery while stuck on a train watching a film. Or, you know, the replacement bus service because, you know, trains on Sundays. Also, the mobile reception on trains, never that great, and their Wi-Fi costs a surprisingly large amount. So, streaming is out a fair bit at the time, but a UMD, yeah, that works when there's no internet at all. Same also goes for on holiday abroad. No one wants to pay those mobile fees. Not that we're going to be doing that anytime soon. PSPs and their games and their movies are pretty cheap at the moment. Okay, they've gone up a little bit, but they're still, you know, plenty of bargains to be had. Lots of people still think of the PSP as just old rather than retro, which leads them to thinking, oh, well, I may as well just sell it and, you know, see if I can get a bit of money for it. So you can find people selling whole bundles of games or movies. Same with the PSP devices themselves. People will quite often sell them with all the games they happen to have for it. You know, in five years' time, everyone will think of these things as retro and you'll be wondering, damn, why did I buy this stuff when it was cheap? Yeah, at the end of the 90s, you could pick up Amiga stuff for absolute peanuts. Now you charge an arm and a leg just for a basic accelerator card. Now, if you decided to buy a PSP, you may be thinking, which one? Well, my favourite's still the original PSP, the 1000. It feels much nicer to play, and it has a better UMD drive. And I found it's also lasted a bit better than the latter ones. And quite a few of them have had to do a bit of repair work on the UMD drive to get it going. However, uh, that said, any of the UMD-based PSPs, you know, are pretty good options. And you can buy games from them and just play them no messing around. I mean, the 1000, the 2000 and the 3000, they all have batteries that are really easy to replace. And, you know, you're probably going to want a new one. As a 17-year-old neglected battery, yeah, they don't tend to hold a lot of charge. Now it's time to talk about the PSP Go. I said before, I changed my mind over them, and it's all to do with the fact that you can now replace the firmware on a PSP with one that lets you play ISO images. And this, of course, includes the PSP Go. So if you've got a PSP with a UMD drive, then you can use it to rip any game or movie you own and then simply copy the ISO image across to the PSP Go. So the PSP Go really does make sense as a second PSP. Or if you only want to play stuff that, you know, you've downloaded. It's light, it's compact, it fits in your pocket. And, you know, it does Bluetooth, so you can use your Bluetooth headphones and everything. And all you have to do is copy an ISO image across to it using USB and, you know, you're ready to, well, go. Yeah, there really is a lot to be said for the Go's convenience. What really crippled it was Sony forcing you to buy everything from the store and preventing you from using any discs you already owned. So this replacement firmware really does solve that problem, which is pretty handy as Sony is just closing down the store for the PSP. Now in terms of how it fits in the range, well, it really does have the nicest screen of all the PSPs. So if you're out on a bright sunny day, yeah, the PSP's Go screen is a heck of a lot more usable than all the others. 
The remaining drawback is probably changing the battery. Because instead of just having a nice easy battery cover you take out and then you just pop in a new one, you gotta open the whole thing up. Admittedly, it's not the hardest device to open up. I mean, it's just got four screws, and then you gotta be really careful prying it open. But then the battery itself, well, it's just a little cable, and you just pop the thing out, pop the new one in, and then reassemble the whole device. Of course, if opening up devices is not really your thing, or you just consider this just way too much faffage to change the battery, then, you know, the PSP Go may not be your thing. Well, if you've made it through all the way to the end, I'd like to say thank you very much for watching. I'd also like to thank Rose Tinted Spectrum and Watto Snorkers for contributing their voice talents to this one. And if you like this video, why not click the little thumbs up-y thing? And if you really, really liked it, why not share it with other people you think also might enjoy it? Don't share it with people you think will hate it, that's, that's probably a bad idea. It would also be really helpful if you click the subscribe button to the channel, because small channels like this really do need subscriptions so the algorithm picks us up. You might consider gently clicking the little bell icon so the subscription button does the thing you expected it was going to all along.